to ever face in our lives. Uh, but hey, uh, you know, every challenge, there are two, two ways to look at it, right? You look at it either as a problem or you, you look at it as an opportunity. Um, uh, I would like to see it as an opportunity and, and, and indeed uh, it is an opportunity uh, for me today uh, that I have, uh, I have the pleasure of delivering this session uh, here for you all, um, which I, I think is, is very much a byproduct of the current situation that we are in, right? Um, anyway, that's at least how I see it, uh, always looking at looking for an opportunity. Uh, my name, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is uh, Ali Yazgar Muchala. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm more popular, uh, in at least in the professional circle, uh, I'm more popular as Ali. Uh, I am a level three certified chief architect working as a vice president uh, at uh, Cab Chennai India uh, Private Limited. Uh, I am based out of Mumbai, uh, have over about 20 plus years of experience. Um, and the, during this time, uh, I've had the, the opportunity uh, to work with several of our global clients um, to help them design and architect their uh, digital and cloud transformation uh, journeys. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about microservice architecture. Uh, something I'm sure uh, you've all, uh, uh, a lot of you at least, have, have heard about in the past. Um, some of you may have also done a lot of research on this topic uh, or may have even got, uh, you know, hands-on experience, might be actually uh, working on it on, on a regular basis. Um, and it's, it's and I agree. It's it's, it's not really a uh, I would say a new topic uh, or a new trend uh, in, in that sense, uh, and and definitely not in the context of uh, the rate at which technology has been evolving these days, right? It's it's, it's so so microservices have been around for um, three four years, uh, three to four years at least, uh, I, I think, and uh, it's quite a long time actually. Um, but surprisingly. You know, in, in spite of it being around for three, four years, um, I can tell you a uh, few organizations have actually got it right, um, which is why I actually chose this topic for for today's uh, presentation. And, and, and uh, that's what we will try and cover today as well, uh, you know, in terms of what are those 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 design cons considerations, what are those uh, best practices um, uh, or even anti-patterns, you know, around microservices architecture that helps it and that makes it work for for organizations. So we will cover that in today's topic. Uh, but before that, uh, uh, we will first start with a bit of bit of history. You know how software development evolved from mainframes to microservices. Um, and this is important why um, you know, uh, I, I want to cover that. So, so we will start with that. We will then also um, touch upon a very, a, uh, a very contentious uh, topic on uh, SOA versus microservices. And so it's a hugely popular debate. You know, any any article you see online um, uh, on microservices, I'm sure it will uh, touch upon this topic. Um, as well, uh, and my session would really be incomplete if I don't uh, uh, talk about that. Uh, uh, so versus microservices uh, differences. So I will share my perspective um, on on that as well. And then, uh, lastly, as I said, we will touch upon some of the notions, some of the design considerations um, that are relevant, that are uh, important to to make microservices architecture work for you. Uh, towards the end, uh, I do intend to leave some time uh for q a um so i believe a google sheet a google forms link has been shared with you and uh, i would uh, request you to please start posting your questions there as 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 we progress along in the session um and then as as i get a chance uh, you know i will try and answer some of those questions as well okay so let's uh as I said, let's let's spend a, a few minutes into the past, right? The history of software development. Um, as I said, and I will start with with the mainframes. It was the 80s, you know, 1980s, 
uh, where software development was all on mainframes. Um, uh, back then, the rate of change was very slow, right? IT, IT was never into mainstream business. It was always considered a back office function. Um, and it continued that way for many years, you know, many years until uh, desktop desktop PCs or personal computers were, were, were invented, right? This is around the early 90s when, when with the advent of desktops and, and PCs, um, which actually then gave rise to client server technologies, you know, for GL, for generation language, uh, language uh, uh, like 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 uh, Visual Basics and Power Builders, etc., flourished um, as it as as uh, not only it provided a very easy way to build applications through drag and drops and stuff like that, but also give a very uh, easy, uh, you know, uh, good looking look and feel, uh, refreshing change in terms of the look and feel for the end users as opposed to the you know, green screens offered by mainframes. Um, and, and uh, you know, it was, it, was, it, it was about late 90s or, or you know, maybe mid 90s when, uh, uh, when internet and, and the, the World Wide Web uh, became center stage and, and we saw you know, things like the dot, dot com boom, etc., which which actually gave rise to web based applications, um, in which you know we did, you did not even need a, a thick client installed, like in the case of client server applications, it was all browser based. So it became even more easier uh, uh, for 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 building applications, for deploying applications uh, to be used by 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 the consumers. Um, and now, just as internet was becoming a commonplace um, an important concept of uh, it was called as distributed computing started coming to the fore right i don't know if you 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 are aware of these you know rmi uh, remote method invocation actually that's what it used to stand for dcom or distributed um, communication corba um, these were some of the uh, you know technologies that that were part of the the, the distributed computing uh, area uh, and, and in those days it was it I, I would I would uh, admit it it didn't it wasn't too popular uh, and then there were several reasons um, uh, for that uh, it, it, it did not um, pick up very um, you know very well um, but uh, it was very early days actually. Uh, back then, obviously, for, for distributed computing. But uh, the most important thing was it was the first time uh, that uh, a concept of a service was introduced into uh, into software development, right? Uh, and I think that is a very important milestone, uh, a major step forward. And I, and I think, you know, I believe that that's, that was really the start of the, the, the SOA renaissance, uh, okay? Now, obviously, as I said, it didn't, uh, you know, it wasn't, it didn't last for long. It, it very quickly evolved into eventually mainstream SOA or service-oriented architecture. And pretty much by, by you can say, you know, the, 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 the end of the first decade of, 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 of this millennium, by, by 2010, we pretty much started seeing a proliferation of uh, uh, enterprise service bus or or ESBs uh, as it's more popularly known as right right yeah so it, it this this concept of SOA brought about you know modularization componentization decoupling of functionality etc lots of benefits and while uh, while all of that seemed great it seemed like a silver bullet um, it was just then when Ma Martin Fowler uh, who I'm sure a lot of you are aware of you you probably read a lot of his books as well. Um, that's that's precisely the time when you know Martin Fowler introduced the concept of microservices. Now we will obviously get into a lot more details in terms of what is microservices, uh, but but before we get there, right? Why was this history? Why was this context uh, relevant? Right? The point I'm trying to make, the point I want you all to realize, uh, you know, uh, uh, which is. Um, apparent in, in across this entire uh, journey, right across this entire evolution, is that with every change that 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 happened, right, every new uh, technology that was introduced, um, the primary driver over there was uh, business agility. Okay, 
And what I mean by that is um, the need to make it easier and faster to build applications and deploy business solutions uh, into production, right? For, 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 for users to use. So IT was no longer uh, you know, the, the, the back office function in an enterprise like it used to be in the mainframe days, right? IT was now becoming an enabler for, for implementing the core business functions of an enterprise, right? So, so, so business agility was 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 really important. Um, the, the business would not obviously wait for three months, six months for IT to upgrade their system so that a new uh, deployment could happen or a new enhancement could be released, right? They would they would want things to be deployed and, and made available sooner, right? Um, that was the, the 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 key key driver across all of these changes, right? And, and uh, today, in today's session, uh, we will talk about um, not just what, what is microservices, but we'll also touch upon uh, how microservices architecture enables uh, business agility um, or this, this, this speed of change, right? It is something that is really core to the concept of uh, microservices and microservice architecture and the, 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 the larger, the overall cloud native ecosystem okay so let's uh, talk about what is microservice architecture okay um, basically it's an architectural style in which we build a system from a collection of services such that each of these service is completely uh, independent, isolated, scalable, uh, resilient to failure, etc. Right? And independent is the key word over there. Eh? Completely independent. And and when I say independent, it's really independent to an extent that it completely, you know, everything is uh, its own. It manages its own stuff. Right? It has its own database. It has its own even team to support and maintain the service, all independent, right? Nothing, nothing shared. Now, now, uh, to understand this uh, uh, a bit more, you know, let's let's take an example. Okay, let's say I wanted to. Uh, we were we were you know, talking. We were trying to build a, uh, a typical e-commerce uh, application which has uh, various functionalities like shopping cart. Uh, product search, uh, pricing, order, etc. Right, all of these different uh, functions or modules that that make up an e-commerce application. Now, if this was this application, if this application was developed using the traditional uh, monolith uh, as as a monolith application, right, we would typically have had one big application consisting of a a, a single base framework. Uh, underlying framework upon which each of these modules uh, like shopping cart, product search, etc., would all be developed on top of this base, base, base architecture based framework. Uh, and each of these would be very tightly by, by virtue of all, you know, extending from the same framework, it would all be very tightly coupled into this, this, this one single app, um, right? Um, we would also have one single database, you know, a master database. Uh, which has most of the table specific to your customer, product, order, everything, uh, you know, uh, combined into a single master e-commerce database or whatsoever that would be specific to that application. Uh, uh, everything, all this entire, all of these functions, modules would all typically get packaged, uh, built into a single uh, distributable or a binary file, right? Whether it's an EAR, file or, or a msa file or an exe or bit, but basically one binary that gets deployed uh, because of which also the release cycles um, for each of these modules have to be uh, sort of aligned so so what i mean by that is let's say if i was making a change in the shopping cart um, uh, functionality right and let's say I, I was done with my change it was a quick change small change i, I made my change and i'm ready to test uh, the change, but I cannot move to um, to, to SIT environment uh, because maybe the the product and the pricing and some of the other teams are still not done. They are still not ready, right? So the entire thing has to be packaged together to be 
built together and 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 shipped into production uh, and then typically there would be like also like one big team involved in building and supporting this and this entire application so so if you think of it right when you, this kind of a scenario it's almost very rigid almost very like you know moves at its own slow pace right it's like uh, having a white elephant right it it, it, it can't be agile it can't uh, uh, be something that will uh, change that can that can change very quickly right on the other hand right if i was developing this using microservices architecture right uh, no, no, no. Go back to the to, to the definition, right? We are now talking about uh, my, what is microservice architecture. Each uh, application uh, comprising of several services, which are all independent of each other, right? Uh, 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 independently deployable, etc. So, if I would build it using microservices, each of these business function, for example, right? Shopping cart is one function. Product search is the other function. Pricing is the third function. Each of these would be developed as a separate service, pretty much, you know, in a separate application by itself. Each one think of it as a separate application. Shopping cart is like one application. Product search is like another mini application. Now, uh, when you when I say application, uh, it it has its own architecture, its own code base, its own its own database. Um, uh, you know each because i say each one has its own architecture i also have the uh, the the independence of you know choosing what i what architecture what technology i want to use for shopping cart versus what i want to use for product search um, etc so so in that sense uh, it's 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 fairly you know independent uh, that way uh, each function also package into its own binary separately right it's it's so you have a shopping cart ear file or product search ear files so all of these services package into its own library um, and also uh, each service has its own dedicated team typically right that manages and builds that particular service now this sort of a modularized independent way of building applications uh, gives you complete freedom complete freedom to deploy your changes at each micro application level uh without have to having to worry about some of the other, you know what the other applications are doing so so unlike earlier right in this case if i was done with my change in the shopping cart service i could go ahead and you know start testing it validating it i would go ahead and de deploy it as well ship it to the next environment without having to worry whether uh, you know the order service is ready or not now that's independence right that's business agility what what the the, the business really seeks for right um and to be honest with you it's not just about that uh, that freedom from those dependencies between those other applications it also becomes you know uh, a lot easier to manage these smaller lighter um, applications uh, as opposed to to a monolith uh, application and then uh, if any of you have worked on a typical enterprise uh, scale monolith application you would realize what i'm saying you know it, it it literally takes sometimes 10 10 minutes 15 minutes sometimes to just restart or redeploy a monolith application uh, because it's just so heavy and so resource, resource intensive right it takes time to get the application server up the applications up etc and when i say it's 10 minutes to restart an application basically what we are saying is it's 10 minutes of outage right 10 minutes of outage of the application 10 minutes of revenue loss imagine this was uh you know amazon or 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 one of your your you know uh, e-commerce uh, applications right 10 minutes of outage the kind of revenue loss that that company would have because of that outage <clears throat> which is exactly why <coughs> excuse me even when you wanted to deploy just one line of change in in a monolith application uh, your change management team would never be comfortable approving that right uh, until unless you followed the, the the release cycles and etc right so even if it's a one line change uh, you won't get the approval whereas in the case of microservices right it can almost happen seamlessly you know thanks to um, the 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 complete cloud native uh, ecosystem and we'll just come come to that um, in a minute uh, but literally at uh, at the click of a button you can ha without having any manual intervention involved you could have your 
your your applications deployed tested everything okay so that's it, what microservices architecture is in summary and that's <coughs> also how microservices architecture uh, facilitates or provides uh, <coughs> this uh, business agility in your systems okay okay so we now uh, sorry about that so we now move to the all important uh, you know <laughs> uh, debate on 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 uh, so versus uh, microservices um, but before we get into that uh, comparison uh, with with SOA versus microservices, right? I want to look at the formal definition of microservices architecture. What does the what are the 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 experts uh, uh, how are they describing microservices architecture is? So again, let's go back to Martin Fowler, right? He's he's the the, he's the, 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 the one who who introduced the concept of microservices. You know, he's considered the father of microservices. And he says, you know, if you go to martinfowler.com, um, this is picked up from there, uh, Microsoft's architecture is basically about designing applications as a set of independently deployable services. Independently deployable services. Microservices.io, another very popular website uh, on, on this topic, uh, now that defines microservices architecture as uh, a style that structures applications as a collection of services uh, that are maintainable, testable, uh, loosely coupled, independently deployable, etc. Okay. Now, in both these definitions, right? If you just ignore the term independently deployable, okay, uh, and if you if I would just read out the remainder of the uh, the definition, right? Uh, it's a, a way about designing apps using a set of services, a set of services that are maintainable, loosely coupled, testable, right? All of these aspects are very much equally applicable to SOA, service-oriented architecture as well, right? You could, you, if I, in fact, if I would just say that, you might actually get misled into thinking that I'm talking about SOA, right? Um, so is microservices architecture just basically uh, an extension, you know, something that extends the functional decomposition concept of SOA to the deployment architecture? So functional decomposition was always there in SOA as well, right? There was a concept of building business functionality as services, right? Just that it was deployed as, 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 as a monolith. But uh, if we would extend that, that decomposition, if you would extend that separation to the deployment um, architecture. Um, in other words, you know, if this separation modularization uh, was extended to the to the deployment layer, would the same SOA become MSA? Probably, right? Because uh, in that sense, you know, I, if you look at the definition from that perspective. There's nothing radically different about MSA than what we are talking about. Uh, so, uh, um, other than the the uh, independently deployable or you know extending that independence to the deployment architecture aspect, right? Now, if I say that, uh, obviously, I, I, <laughs> I don't mean to to suggest uh, you know microservices architectures is, is nothing but so. Obviously, there are some um, uh, nuances, and we will try and cover all of that today. Uh, but when I say that, right, from a definition perspective as well, um, the immediate question you might think of is uh, why did when 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 service-oriented architecture talk about functional decomposition, why did SOA not extend it to to the deployment layer? You know, why uh, did SOA limit the the concept of functional decomposition to the logical and physical architecture itself? Right. <laughs> um, the simple answer is, you know, if you see the definition of of of, of uh, service-oriented architecture. Oops, sorry. Uh, if you see the definition um, of of service-oriented architecture, uh, 
um, actually so i never said that uh, when you decompose apps into services it, sh it should be done only in the logical layer or or up to this layer and it should not be implemented in the deployment layer uh, so i never propagated that idea of 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 uh, putting all these services package into a single deploy deployment unit you know or a distributable that was not what soa ever mentioned it was just how people implemented soa at that point of time remember we are talking uh, in in still in in 2010s right uh, early 20 to 2005 uh, 2010 time frame right um so that's just how how, how people ended up implementing uh, soa and why so why did people implement it that way because in those days um cloud technologies one that popular it wasn't center stage uh, uh, you know anyways there was no uh, uh, things like you know, devops and and the whole concept of ci cd and build test deploy automation etc that we see so popular today that weren't very common uh, then it was just being you know talked about just being introduced at, at at that point of time so it was all being done manual so manually so imagine right today we have one binary one distributable that you have to manage you have to deploy there to 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 different uh, environments you break that down into n number of different uh, distributables the kind of uh, management nightmare would, that would lead to in terms of managing that many number of uh, deployments manually um, that would be quite uh, quite tedious right so 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 the obvious decision then given the context uh, the larger ecosystem that existed at that time was to do it uh, was to build it as one single uh, deployment unit right um but 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 in my view so it so 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 microservices in that case then is just nothing but now leveraging the advancements in the technology such as cloud devops etc and applying them to soa right and 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 that's what gives you microservice architecture um with respect to the, the diagram that you have on the, the right of the screen right um i am you know all uh, iit students so, so i assume you are all very familiar with sets and you know mathematics and everything uh, so so you know right if you think of soa service oriented architecture as the universal set right now you can implement service oriented architectures using cloud technologies only and that's still soa you can implement you can you know add devops uh, on your traditional soa and that's still soa Uh, service oriented architecture right uh, you could leverage you know containers and you know all of that and, and uh, it by itself for your services and it would still be so on but when you actually do all of this together you know uh, and when you have that intersection set that intersection set uh, is uh, what what is microservices architecture right you leverage cloud and when i say cloud again it does not have to be the 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 the, the more popular public cloud right it could be still a, a private cloud on your own data center as well right um but just uh, having the ability to to deploy vms bring up etc uh, you know manage those uh, effectively through your uh, you know cloud platforms um so 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 you leverage cloud you deploy those clouds on containers so that uh it's completely and independently managed you know though each of those instances can be uh independently managed the the you have the concept of agile and devops uh to have small sized um you know sprint teams um uh, which are supported by the automation of you know builds and deployments by virtue of having the ci cd implemented etc all of that put together gives you what is known as microservice architecture right um so remember one thing okay although it may not be explicitly stated anywhere okay to have a true value of microservices architecture it is um, you know uh, uh, um, which which obviously the true value of microservice architecture is, is really in in extreme business agility right that's as i said that's the main driver um but but to have that uh, with with microservices architecture 
it is absolutely essential to not just follow the 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 the, the, the architectural concept right the 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 isolation the independent at the deployment layer but also um, think about devops think about agile think about cloud and containerization uh, and if you do all of that you know that's what will ensure that your project is a success okay i've seen many uh, implementations of microservices wherein uh, yeah they're talking great things in terms of architecture and technology but end of the day they're still following the traditional rub based methodology for software development uh, so they'll never see the benefits true benefits or the end to end benefits of 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 the business agility that that microservices are still right okay so that's uh, anyways my views on 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 microservices versus soa right it's it's uh, um, uh, you know it's it's an extension of the uh, the 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 uh, layer the, the independence uh, the, the deployment uh, uh, to the deployment layer extension of the, the functional decomposition to the deployment layer and it is also basically uh, taking advantages of the technology advancements uh, in uh cloud and in in in, in devops etc along with soa which which basically makes um, microservice architecture okay before i move away from this topic i just want to leave you with this um you know one uh, thought uh, i have okay um you you may you may uh, you may you may have this question based on what i just said on the previous slide that if it was just a you know if microservices was just an evolution of soa you know just just uh, applying some of the 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 benefits of cloud containerization agile devops to soa that's what was msa or or rather microservice architecture why did we bother uh, with a new trend a new jargon why did we not call it just soa 2.0 or something of that sort right i don't know so i i i, I cannot answer that question if if, if at all you're thinking on those lines uh because i do think about that i was i do think about uh it you know why did we not call a college just over to zero but uh it's just a food for thought for you okay i i will not uh, i cannot answer that question right i you you probably need to uh raise that question with with, with martin fowler who invented this 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 concept this term uh, but i will leave you with one thought though okay uh if you take the analogy of cars right um they have been around for for while for decades um and they have evolved over over years right uh, we used to have the the first versions of cars that ran on coal and dust uh, you know steam engines stuff like that which uh, then evolved into cars that ran on on petrol and diesel and then more recently you know cngs um uh, and then and now we are talking about cars that will run on electricity okay so as the fuel and energy domain uh, has evolved uh, and we've seen transformations there the the automobile industry the cars have adopt, adapted to those evolutions and and and, and embraced some of those um, trends into uh, into their product uh, but still we call them cars right we don't name them differently so i don't know whether uh, you know it's it's uh, it's really microservices architecture is it you know soa 2.0 3.0 whatever anyways we will just leave that argument there uh, it, it you know anyways does not matter as they as they say it right what's in the name okay so we will now gradually get into uh, some of the uh, the uh, notions um, of of uh, associated with um, microservices um, architecture and um, so and 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 while you know i spent the last few minutes talking about soa versus microservices architecture um, in reality if you ask me right when we talk about actual implementations these both also go pretty well hand in hand in an in an actual enterprise landscape and that's what we would actually recommend okay so soa service oriented architecture provides uh, an easy way to manage your message transformations is resilient uh, so in in that sense it's really an ideal technology uh, for 
for implementing inter application integrations eai for example right enterprise application integrations would be a perfect uh, case for for uh, to to be implemented using an, an esb uh, enterprise service bus sort of a thing okay however okay when you talk about these applications that the esb is integrating if you zoom into one of those applications and you typically look at the architecture of that application per se now into this application generally you would see uh, cases where you're seeing you know frequent changes enhancements upgrades etc uh, that keep ha happening um, the, you know, by virtue of the business uh, uh, wanting to make changes um, etc uh in order to support those, those business agility you will have those um changes happening and and to 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 enable that is a uh, business agility uh it would be ideal to use microservices architecture at that application layer okay so in that sense you know both esb and your your you know more traditional the service oriented architecture and microservices architecture uh, can and in 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 many cases should coexist uh, and then that's really um something that that works very well uh, in an in an enterprise scale uh, situations um another very interesting question that often comes up uh, in the context of microservices uh, is uh, how small does a service have to be to be to be qualified as a microservice right and I, i i can't blame you know uh, anyone asking that question because it's it's how we've just named it right you already had a concept of service right and then we introduce a new concept called microservice so our obvious assumption there would be that microservice is something that is a very micro version of a service right or a small version of the service and when we say small right how small uh, how small should it be uh and in in software uh, parlance right when we say when we try to measure the size of a of a software what sort of metrics do we use we use lines of code typically right uh, this is always these many you know, thousand lines of code etc and then and honestly i have actually uh, uh you know been asked this question right? okay uh, up to how many maximum locs or or lines of code right is it possible to have in a microservice okay in that context i will tell you size does not matter okay uh, so it does not matter how many lines of code that's that's never the the right yardstick um, to to be used uh, the the ideally ideally okay the the only thing that matters is what does that microservice do what is it doing you know uh, when you're building a microservice and that's where the concept of single responsibility principle comes in right each microservice should be designed in such a way that it performs one function and only one it's only one single responsibility that it has so if the function is to provide shopping cart uh, capability that's what it is it should not bother about order orders it should not bother about uh, products um, or any of those uh, functionalities right um uh and 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 yeah and 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 you know if if really uh as long as you 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 follow that one principle one single responsibility principle for for microservices um irrespective of of the size irrespective of whether it you know had you know 20 lines of code or or you know 2000 lines of code it, it that's that's fine i don't think that's a problem uh, the only other uh, metric uh, i've seen uh, uh, and i've seen people use uh, is in terms of the team size required to build and maintain uh, this service okay um and jeff bezos uh, you know heads uh, amazon right he he once said it right a good yardstick is is the two pizza rule is two pizza rule right uh, uh, a team uh, uh, you know uh, you know if it exceeds beyond a point where where you need more than two pizzas to feed the team we feed that team then you know 
uh, it's too big a team and you know it's too big a service that you have you've packed uh, into one microservice. So, so you probably need to talk about uh, further decomposing that, right? Now, now, obviously, you know, I know, you know, it, it all depends on how hungry, hungry the team is. Uh, honestly, if I'm starving, I could finish an entire pizza myself. Uh, but obviously, that's just a notional thing, right? The, the 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 only real metric is single responsibility principle. Remember that. Okay. Um, the next point uh, that I want to I want to talk about in the context of microservices around technical debt and 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 how the the Polyglot architecture of uh, microservices helps eliminate that. It's a very important topic, right? And I think we 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 also touched upon it uh, when we took the uh, or the um, when we when we talked about the the definition of microservice and we uh, tried to explain that example. Let's go back to the example, right? Let's suppose we were uh, uh, going back to that e-commerce application uh, that we were uh, trying to build, uh, right? Now, if I was de developing that again as a monolith. But I, as I mentioned, I would have a base framework defined, uh, a, a technology uh, decision made uh, upfront, and as part of that 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 very first phase of the project, uh, let's say I decide that I want to build it using Java J2EE, right? That decision is made. Okay. Then when I implement pricing, shopping cart, orders, etc., all of these functionalities on top of that base architecture, they all have to follow that technology. They all have to pretty much inherit that those technologies and, and follow that framework that base architecture right um uh, i i cannot have let's say uh, shopping cart built using uh java and and, and uh, order built using dot uh, net okay now now the so so that's that's uh you know you're stuck with with that technology right that's that one that's one aspect um of, of the technical debt um also you know um i will uh, I'll mention about another aspect right as time goes by right, by virtue of having this this one single base architecture and all right as as you build this application as time goes by <coughs> we we keep adding more and more functionality enhancements etc to this application and uh, over a period of time right it makes the entire code base very patchy uh right and 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 when i say that i say that because for every new feature right if if it's a big feature if it needs a change in the in the base framework itself right often it may not be possible uh to to make that change uh right because it may have um far reaching impacts right it may impact the entire uh, all other modules and 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 you may need to uh, do complete end to end testing and you may not have as much time so what do you do you end up going around with a going going about with a workaround fix, which is not clean, which is not ideally how it should it should have been done. But given the the situation, given the the you know um, you have to fix it quickly, you try and do a quick patch. You do a, try and do a, a workaround fix, and over a period of time, all of these patches sort of make your code really messy, right? Uh, and eventually, when there is a a, a big change coming up you end up having to first refactor the entire code do a, a full flare, full blown cleanup uh, you know which is an application wise before application wide cleanup before you can even start think of implementing that fix or that project right? and that is what is really uh, te technical debt right and then and, and as i mentioned in the first case also right like uh, you know each each for each functionality you have you decided the technology tomorrow let's say i say i want to add product recommendations as, as a new feature in my application now product recommendations which uses some you know really smart ai algorithm uh, which i have developed uh, which can look at the customers you know buying patterns and age and all those other uh, fantastic things to come up with what could be uh, a good recommendation for this specific customer and i've written some some of those algorithms or whatsoever ai algorithms in in python uh, what do i do i cannot use that because I, I i cannot integrate that into my e-commerce application right that's that's a challenge because of this technical debt think of it on the other side of it of the story right if it was microservices architecture each service as i said is a separate application by itself right you could choose whichever technology i want to uh, and for each of the service right there is no constraint 
um, and hence there is no 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 technical debt and this exact this concept of being able to choose uh, the the kind of technology the, the appropriate technology for that specific functionality is what is known as poly polyglot architecture right and this polyglot architecture enables you to eliminate technical debt which is a very very important and critical aspect okay uh, companies today you know if you ask any it operations head okay they will tell you this they end up spending significant amount of money in trying to deal with this technology technical debt okay um, so 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 microservices architecture has has a significant advantage uh, in that sense as well okay i'm going to try and uh, go through this a little uh, quickly now um, uh, a lot of these points have been covered in some of the earlier uh, slides as well but i do want to leave some time for q and a so quickly uh, you know uh, we did talk about the isolation part the independence part right the important part is having this isolation implemented at every layer the logical architecture obviously you have your different components uh, independent uh, you know each each module uh, designed independently in your architecture logical architecture when you talk about physical architecture your code base you know it is again separated in almost you know you even have your separate code projects and 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 and, and uh, source code repositories for each uh, each application or each each functionality uh, for each microservice actually and um, not just logical not just physical even deployment architecture right you build it package it we have we've talked about it a number of times um, also isolation at the data layer so so uh, you know each microservice having its own database i use uh, i may use and when i say database it's not just you know uh, separate tables huh? i'm talking about proper database services in fact i could even have a cynic scenario where i've used an rdbms like mysql or oracle for uh, or uh, for for product search for product uh, microservices or order microservices but i'm using let's say uh, uh, a no sql database uh, for like like neo4j or you know, mongodb or whatever for uh, pricing service i mean that's possible okay and actually this part the data level isolation is also a very tricky part okay um which i think has to be handled carefully because think about the scenario where uh, uh, you know you, you let's say you're creating a report you know uh, which obviously obviously you you need in, in such applications um and in that report you'll obviously want to you know join across all of these different uh, tables to get a holistic view customers uh, orders products etc um if you end up breaking these all into separate database servers database technologies even how do you do that right that becomes a challenge so there 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 are obviously patterns there are different uh, approaches you could take uh, towards that for this particular case specifically you know you you should look at have re, having a separate uh, reporting database whether it's an enterprise data warehouse or something which is kept in sync with your crud databases your primary databases and you done your reporting out of that you never run your reporting out of your core microservices specific databases so that sort of uh, you know patterns are obviously um uh, there which which should be leveraged when you talk about uh, these uh, challenges associated with this isolation but but remember it is something that um we have to uh, look at doing at every layer okay scalability and uh, elasticity now now i'm assuming uh you all uh, are very familiar with the concepts of what is scalability and 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 what is uh, uh, elasticity and the difference between the two with monolith applications it's never easy to scale right because uh, the the minimum uh, the least count right the minimum deployment size uh, of the application is the entire application itself it cannot go smaller than that right that's that's the distributable the, the only uh, one size distributable that i have so if i had to scale i would have to scale the entire app that many times so if i want to do if i'm getting more load and if i want to add a new instance to cater to this uh, increased load i i have to create another instance of the entire application even if the load is just coming on my on let's say the product search service so i'm seeing a lot of requests coming to the product service but other services are fine they are they are working okay uh, the load is not great so ideally i just want to focus on scaling up the product service but my uh, monolith application wouldn't let me do that right i have to scale up the entire application but i can very easily 
uh, do that using microservices architecture, also using containerization technology, et cetera. It's also, you know, elasticity also is, is very much inbuilt, right? Uh, as as uh, the, the workload goes down, I can very easily bring down some instances without having to, to worry too much. Um, so again, scalability, elasticity, uh, important aspect uh, when we talk about uh, microservices. Um, Uh, choreography versus orchestration. Um, again, a, a very uh, important point when we talk about service composition. Now, now when we talk about you know microservice architecture, we've broken down the functionality into independent uh, services. Now, the question is uh, to implement an end-to-end -end business use case. You still need to orchestrate across each of these functions. If I want to complete an order, right? I still have to make the uh, create order service, I have to invoke the payment service, I have to invoke the email notification service. Um, it typically SOA approach, this is all done using an um, orchestration layer, uh, you know, that stitches all of these pieces together, right? Uh, and significantly, now typically that takes significantly longer uh, when you run those orchestrations in a, in a sequential manner. And also over a period of time, this orchestration layer becomes like a, a spaghetti, right? Uh, which is becoming, which is going to also uh, like a nightmare to manage, right? Microservice architecture recommends a choreography approach, in which the intercommunication is done using an event-driven approach. Now, there's this concept of dumb pipes and smart endpoints, right? Where you don't put any logic into your pipe or your bus. Uh, you know, just just every service will just post a message, um, and every other microservice is smart enough to realize whether this message is uh, is relevant for for me or not and if yes should i pick it up and start processing it otherwise i will just ignore it and let it go for somebody else to pick it up right so that sort of approach um, gives you a lot of benefits it, you know a lot of um, uh, parallel processing that can be done which reduces your time considerably allows you to scale um, easily and also there is no single point of failure like we had in the orchestration layer so Again, a very important part uh, point uh, around choreography. When you're implementing microservices architecture, this is this is a very 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 key point uh, to 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 decide. You know what you're using uh, for your service um, uh, choreography, microservices choreography. You need a, a robust distributed uh, uh, messaging or a, you know a system such as you know kafka or whatever right uh, but but a uh, lot of different options available out there but but something that you should think about um just two real quick uh, things i want to talk about before we uh, you know get into some of the questions a um, you know when you have so many microservices uh, it becomes uh, difficult to to manage monitor track how your services are doing so it's important very very important to ensure you have a, a well-defined monitoring set of uh, set of monitoring tools that that analyze that that you know monitor your your services different aspects of it uh, set up thresholds for each service that give out, give you give out notifications alerts etc uh, and there are several uh, tools available again Nagios you know App Dynamics Dynatrace etc um, you you really need to or, or you could even create your custom dashboards using Elastic Log Stash and Kibernata Stack and stuff like that, but but it's really important you sort of set up uh, a control room that gives you uh, this this observability of your microservices. And also, likewise, you know, when you have so many microservices, it's important to know where your microservices are. I mean, I say where your microservices are. What I mean by not in terms of you know <laughs> literally where, but uh, in terms of you know. Uh, how where are they deployed, right? What are their endpoints? Because as I said, you know, with scalability, you 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 bring up new instances of your microservices, or you bring down new instances of microservices. How does one know which instance or of this service to to redirect this this request to, right? Um, and then for that, you you have to think about uh, you know some some good uh, you know, service discovery tool, service locator patterns, etc., to be implemented that can help track this uh, automatically. Otherwise, you know, your, 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 your uh, 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 microservice actually is simply not going to scale and it's not going to work too well. So again, there are several options available. There's you know, 
console or zookeeper kong or even your cloud platforms have like you know the, the api gateways and the like so um, several different options there as well so do, these are some of the you know just to summarize right um, uh, you know we, we talked about some of the, the key design considerations that you should look for uh, when you're designing um, microservices um, and uh, you know when you're doing greenfield development there is absolutely a no brainer always follow microservices architecture uh, it will give the business agility when you talk about um, legacy applications though where you have an existing legacy application and you're uh, you know transforming that into a microservice architecture there could be some challenges in terms of you know how do you manage to uh, your old and new coexisting uh, together and you know uh, your transition etc because this is not going to happen as a big bang release on one fine day right it's going to be a phased uh, transition so that transition phase is is where you have to think about how you're going to co have both of them coexisting and again there are various patterns available um, yeah, that can help you uh, achieve that as well um uh, there are some in implementation options again you could follow pa uh, you know pass based uh, you know platform as a service that are available from cloud platforms you could use you know container orchestration tools like kubernetes etc uh, or you could also use saas functions like you know, you know aws lambdas and azure functions and stuff like that but again um, that's that's a, a completely different new topic uh, i just wanted to uh, leave those options out there uh, things that you can consider when you're implementing uh, microservices architecture. Okay, uh, so with that, I am going to um, uh, get into. Oops, sorry, uh, give me one sec. And let's get into the Q and A. Um, let me see if I have the Q and A sheet uh with me here i okay yes i see a few questions here how do apis become sorry how do apis become more important um, as we transition from monoliths to microservices it is extremely important it is it is it is uh you know it is something that actually drives your your uh, entire strategy uh, of moving from uh, monoliths to microservices, you have to talk about, and then that's where we talk about, you know, uh, you know, uh, um, business domains and business-driven, uh, you know, uh, development. Where what are the business functionalities that are uh, required, and 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 to achieve those functionalities, what are the APIs we need, and that's how you start designing your your uh, microservices access it's definitely a start point uh, in terms of your 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 design discussion okay um, uh, excellent webinar session thank you very much uh, what is the future of um, i microprocessor i think you meant uh, micro, what is the future of micro services um, i think uh, uh, microservices is here to stay okay uh, the, as a concept it's 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 here to stay in the future of microservices i think it's going to evolve in terms of how we um, uh, automate a lot of these things so i went through a lot of concepts you might think that you know i have to think about 200 different things when i try to build microservices there are various um, uh, platforms various uh, frameworks available in the market uh, today you know, Flocker uh, is, is one such uh, tool. Uh, Flutter, uh, another technology, Cloudlets. Um, these are some of the advancements, um, you know, the serverless architecture by itself, right? Is something that uh, would be uh, future, uh, I won't say future of microservices, but uh, you will see ways in which microservices will be, more and more of your microservices will be implemented in future. Okay, rather than it being all bare bones microservice where a developer or the, uh, the, the, the project team has to think about all of these different aspects. So uh, that's the, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the future view of microservices. Um, if we're working on a project, we're trying for a risk brand, we need to get data from GPS, send it to uh, cloud. Can we do it? Of course, yes. I don't see any challenge. I don't know. Uh, um, of course, uh, if you're using uh, 
if you're using uh, devices, especially mobile devices uh, with, with GPS and GSM technologies, um, I would suggest uh, looking at uh, Flutter as as an option as a, as an option for uh, you know as, as a platform as well. It's it's something that was um, introduced by Google recently, so that might actually be a good thing for you to 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 look at. Uh, but uh, thank you for that um, for that question. How ready are enterprises to to move? Uh, to build uh, their application to microservices architecture. Oh, um, I've seen, uh, I think if I talk about the current situation, uh, all, almost every organization, every CIO that we talk to uh, wants to go this route. They understand, they realize that this is the answer to the business agility uh, need uh, you know, of their enterprise and, and, and definitely uh, something that uh, every CIO is um, is is uh, very uh, keen to implement. Of course, there are flavors of microservices. As I said, you know, in some organizations we see there's a pass, and we end up implementing microservices on a on a pass, uh, like OpenShift or or, or you know, you know Pivotal Cloud Foundries, etc. In some cases, we're doing it in terms of serverless, etc. So those vary, but definitely there is a lot of um, uh, opportunity we're seeing uh, on, on microservices. Uh, what advantage do enterprises and businesses see if they're building applications? I, I, like I said, business agility, that's that's the core advantage um, with, with, with uh, microservices. Um, will this um, pandemic uh, in the current situation can affect the recruitment of engineers <laughs> after four years? I think this is not a topic related to, to microservices. I'll, I'll take a pass on this as of now. Let me try and Cover. I know we're running a bit over, so let me try and focus on some of the other questions that are more pertinent to the topic. Uh, does each microservice contain its own UI? Very, very good question. Very good question. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, and from a service perspective, uh, no. Uh, you know, you, you're talking about more from an API perspective, functionality perspective, which is not uh, also uh, linked with the UI, because again, UI can be. Uh, channel specific, right? You may have a service which gives you the functionality. You may want to invoke that same service from your mobile app. You may want to invoke the same service also from your web uh, channels, etc. So, so it's it's really the API. But for UI, for a, from a, from a UI side, there is a concept of uh, micro UIs. Also, specifically, if you look at it from a from an Angular JS perspective, it is possible to 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 implement. Uh, that isolation at, at, at different functionality levels as well. So, so do do look into that topic. It is definitely not packaged into the war or ear file. That's not something that I would recommend. Uh, how to develop, implement uh, in um, application in J2E framework uh, in NetBeans, the microservices, and send me lecture so I query later. Okay, I think this is more about the development environment, uh, setting up the development environment for building microservices. Of course, you could use NetBeans. You could again, it's it's end of the day you're building, you know, Java or .NET or whatsoever it is, basically functions, right? You're de developing uh, services which which would then you know just uh, get deployed into separate um, uh, applications by themselves. So I I don't see any difference in terms of uh, your 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 development and environment setup as such um, for this. Um, can microservices be stateful? Uh, good question. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. And I'm, I, I realize I didn't touch upon uh, this aspect. It is not a uh, it is not a recommended practice. It is not a recommended practice to have microservices be stateful. They should be stateless. Okay, because that is what will enable you to be uh, to help uh, have uh, your uh, scalability distributed etc because when you talk about state you have to save it and then you're saving it in your uh, within your service to make that microservice itself stateful uh, that state has to then get copied into all of those different instances of microservices so that your next service request if it goes to a different instance you know it might not get it so definitely no the state has to be externalized whether it is you know, externalized in your in your data layer or in your web layer in the form of a session, et cetera, is something that you have to decide depending on the kind of application um, and the kind of use case and the scenario that you are treating with. But definitely the, the APIs definitely should be stateless. It's, it should not be stateful. 
Um, great topic. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Uh, just uh, about a uh, few more questions. Uh, can any application framework is available which supports Microsoft? I, I just named a few. There are plenty, right? Like I said, if you talk about, and again, depends if you're talking about PaaS, right? Um, you get platforms uh, from different cloud vendors that give you some of these uh, horizontal cross-cutting concerns available, like your, your, your choreography. For the choreography, you have your messaging um, framework available, API gateways available, service locators, monitoring tools, etc. available, all of that available through the pass. Uh, if you use serverless frameworks, again, you know, your, your cloud platform offers a lot of that. If you go with something like Kubernetes or something, you know, some of the orchestration, container orchestration tools, some of it is available. Some you may have to use different open source or, you know, COTS products to, to have that uh, uh, capability. But definitely a lot of uh, frameworks and tools available on, on, on this. Um, can we develop two microservices which are dependent on each other? Exam example, product and shopping cart. Two microservices are, uh, are dependent on each other. Uh, like I said, if they're dependent, you're basically including, uh, basically creating cohesion, and and hence it's not it goes against the microservices principle. And I I know functionally right, they, you might have some dependencies, but those dependencies have to be managed at your orchestration layer, at your or at your choreography layer, layer at your uh, you know at a channel layer. So if I'm let's say implementing uh you know on your on my uh, web uh, site right if i'm i'm getting uh, product data and uh, customer data let's say and i want to show it um it's it's uh, through that choreography that you will make an api call that will first call your product service get the data next call your uh, maybe you know customer service get the data and press send a, 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 a merge response composite response back to your ui so they can render uh, all of that together but if you think of it, the individual services itself, they cannot be dependent. They have to be independent as such. OK, um, very informative session. Thank you. Uh, how to design functionally decompose module if there is dependency on other modules? No, like I said, so I, I think I just answered it as part of the, the, the previous question, right? You have to manage that through your choreography layer, right? And then and, and the example I gave, for example, even for the reporting, right? Reporting has to cut across layers. So then in that case, you have a separate reporting database. So they're different. It's never a, a, you know, a, a, a single solution that uh, that will apply to all cases. It's never a one size uh, fits all. OK, it is very much case by case basis. Reporting, you typically have your separate EDW sort of reporting database, which is synced up. Uh, in case of you know uh, websites etc where you're showing uh, multiple different data on on the same page you have to manage it through through your choreography etc so so a lot of those like when you do an, an order right you have to do first create an order then send notifications etc so it can be easily be uh, uh, managed through service choreo cho cho choreography right uh, and 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 that's how you would uh, stitch those 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 uh, uh, I won't say business dependencies, okay, not service dependencies. Okay, uh, that's how you would implement uh, those end to end business use cases. Uh, concepts try to make clear, thank you. Um, small teams, uh, how is composition of team? Yeah, I, I touched upon the composition of teams. I think I already mentioned that. Uh, like every microservice has a, a like, you know, a sp small sprint size teams, very much uh, like, like agile sprints, right? They're working on uh specific microservice so, so you talk about things like pods right uh, so there's a the customer service pod there's a product service pod there's an order service pod and a pod is basically a set of you know a bunch of sort of four five you know, or three or two developers depending upon the 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 the, the, the scale or the the complexity involved right and that's about it right they manage that service uh, they are the whole and sole owners um uh, responsible for that particular service uh, very good session. Thank you. It was a good session. Thank you. How distributed transactions can play. Ah, transaction management. Thank you very much. Again, very uh, much something that is uh, managed at a uh, choreography level. Okay. Uh, again, a, 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 a different topic altogether. Why well, would suggest I have? Uh, if you if you Google uh, on on if you if you go to my LinkedIn profile, uh, you know, Adiyas Garmuchala, I have actually 
published a, a post, a, a blog on exactly this topic, like distributed transactions um, can be managed using microservice architecture. This whole concept of service mesh that that allows you to 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 manage and handle this. So uh, while that was not the, the the focus of this topic, but I would encourage you to to read on that maybe that blog if you if you find that interesting or maybe uh, similar uh, other. Uh, articles uh, or, or, or content in, in and around that topic, but definitely a uh, good thing to, to, to read about or know about in the context of microservices. It was a good session. Thank you. What are the different uh, design patterns? I think we covered that right across as I went through uh, each of the slides. Uh, you know, what are the gotchas? What are the 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 uh, things you should be careful about? What are things that you should think about when implementing microservices? We did uh, go through all of those aspects uh, in the session. Um, criteria for us to move from monolithic to microservices. That was exactly my summary slide. I think I. Uh, probably this this question might be before I've got the summary slide. Uh, so as I said, you know, greenfield applications, no brainer, definitely microservice. When you have an existing legacy application which you are uh, moving to microservices, uh, you know, definitely if there are constant changes and there's something that you would would like to implement or like to see more agility in in, in those uh, areas, microservices is the answer. There may be some challenges, but uh, uh, something you should look to. Um, uh, follow and again, I, I have another. Um, uh, you know, I, I have a uh, um, a few blogs posted um, on my LinkedIn profile, or um, you know, if you Google, uh, which will also talk about some of the uh, approaches uh, we followed in you know for some of the case studies we implemented for our clients in terms of how we have managed this phase-wise transition. Uh, which has helped them. So, so do do read do do refer to that, and that might help you um, answer some of these questions as well. Um, logical separation. I didn't understand the difference between logical separation and physical separation. Okay, logical separation is more your uh, logical architecture, right? When you define your classes, when you define your so you you have your separate uh, you know class diagram, package structure, etc. These are these all you know how you are you know logically segregating uh, your 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 uh, classes components etc by by functionality so these are all my shopping cart related these are all my customer related and you will ensure that you they are not directly talking to each other uh, but they should go through the choreography and all of those kind of things right that's your logical architecture physical architecture is basically where you're talking about the actual uh, you know code level physical classes right what are the Class, you know, you're implementing the classes. Are they into its own uh, project? You know, its own uh, code repository. It's, you know, Git repository, for example, for 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 uh, products is different from order, right? If you end up putting it in the same repository, you're basically talking about them being in the same project, and uh, them being in the same project. Uh, you may have implemented logical separation, but physically they are still packaged into one project. Uh, module in the repository, right? And when you do that, when you when you have one single module, you will always have the the possibility of somebody, um, uh, you know, accidentally trying to, uh, you know, from a product class trying to make a reference to the order class, uh, for example, right? So that can always happen. So so physical architecture uh, helps that level of separation. So I hope uh, that 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 helped answer that question as well. Um, logical separation along with server, however, same database, does it fall under purview of Microsoft or not? Uh, uh, if you follow the best practices, no, right? I would not recommend you uh, to have same database uh, when you're implementing you know, across microservices. That's not, uh, because then your database is your single point of failure. It is your one place where it ties all your dependencies together. So, so not something that is recommended. However, I will tell you that I have seen uh, certain implementations where uh, microservices have been using the common database, but uh, obviously over a period of time they end up uh, facing those challenges, and then they've realized and they've had to had to uh, refactor some of those aspects. So, uh, not recommended is my answer. Okay, um, thank you very much, um, everyone. I think I'm done with all the the. 
uh, questions uh, on the Google Sheet. Uh, so um, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I am hoping this was uh, useful. Um, like I said, this is um, this was really uh, you know, something that that uh, to give you food, food for thought to to help you you know realize aspects that you have to think about. Uh, design considerations considerations that you have to take into account when designing microservice architecture. This is not something that will give you all the answers, um, and and it is never. And I cannot give you all the answers, right? Because it is never uh, a, a very simple thing. That for this question, this is the answer, right? It is always it depends on the context, on the use case, on the scenario. There are n number of solutions available, and you have to really assess. Um, and 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 weigh out options when you're when you're selecting, but when you think about all of these design considerations, uh, and then you talk about you know uh, things like choreography, things like monitoring, control panel, service locators, etc., uh, and then the context of your service, you you will realize uh, you know what could be possible options that could be valid scenarios for um, your particular context. With that. I uh, will uh, you know, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and wish you all the very best. Stay safe and all the best for your future. Thank you very much.